presentation titled Auditing Changing Times comes to us from Kristen Keene. Kristen is an internationally certified lead auditor with more than 20 years of experience working on environment, quality, and safety management systems, and is a business consultancy co-founder of Environment Pacific. Her auditing work had originally focused on regulatory compliance and best practice guidance related to environmental duty of care obligations. However, the scope has expanded considerably. Kristen draws on her qualifications and professional experience in biological sciences and business management to provide support for organizations regarding continuity planning, environmental and social governance obligations, and risk management. These services are provided in a variety of sectors such as tourism, energy, renew renewables, telecommunications, government, resources, transport, ports, and global development projects. And with that, take it away, Kristen. Thanks, Mike, and appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's nice to be back presenting for Exemplar Global and this time for the future of auditing. As the name suggests, this is about where auditing is going, which direction or which directions. So all being well, the points raised in my presentation are applicable for you in regard to a range of auditing situations for management systems. So hello, hello everyone, and I hope you are all faring as well as you're able during the current COVID restrictions. As Mike mentioned, my name is Kristen Keane and I'm Director of Environment Pacific, an Australian-based environmental consultancy. Uh, auditing is one of the services we provide for a variety of sectors. And I'm a lead, a certified lead auditor in environmental quality and safety management systems. I've been fortunate to provide auditing services for a number of great clients and on a number of equally great projects. It's one of the reasons I really enjoy auditing management systems so much. Another reason is helping clients meet their regulatory commitments, lower their risk profiles and to meet their risk appetite. It also helps them to improve their governance practices. This slide is an example of a diagram of an ESG hierarchy. It shows a range of considerations for businesses in relation to environmental, social and governance factors. What a diversity of considerations really for industries that may at one point just considered only their financial positions and profit for company owners and shareholders. So in this example, these points read for environmental, climate change strategy, biodiversity, water efficiency, energy efficiency, carbon intensity, environmental management systems. Under social, there's equal opportunities, freedom of association, health and safety, human rights, customer and product responsibilities and child labour. Under governance, business ethics, compliance, board independence, executive compensation, shareholder democracy, care of HSC International. To demonstrate the sort of impacts and how that what uh, I guess applying this in practical terms, this first photo is uh, a coral reef. It's in the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in North Queensland. Um, ongoing auditing assists to identify development activities have the potent, that have the potential to cause environmental harm uh, to environmental values in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. So harm to environmental values potentially compromises their regulatory compliance of, say, the, the said client that, um, in this case, I've been doing auditing for, their environmental policies, sustainability position, their reputation, and potentially shareholder expectations. Another governance issue in terms of looking at a practical application. Uh, this is a community over in Papua New Guinea uh, social impacts to communities can occur in the local community, even your own local community. But in, in a community like this, consider the potential of an undeveloped country and social aspects such as human rights. Audits of management systems can assist to identify aspects potentially lacking in, say, consultation, lack of response to complaints, or non-conformances and improvement opportunities serving to improve the project outcomes in these respects. So whether it is a community that you know in your local government area or a community that may be in another part of the world that may be relatively undeveloped, audits can help 
in both these aspects. Now, tied in WHS workplace health and safety considerations, even though that does fall under the banner of social, because uh, it's such a, uh, a well-known um, consideration in the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's relevant to health and safety as per the ESG slide that was shown earlier. Um, and it's relevant to all persons on a project, whether they are in manufacture, supply chain, production, professional services, or any other aspect of the business. So audits of workplace health and safety can assist to improve safety management generally, including, say, for the diver in this photograph who's undertaking work for a client. This next slide is about regulatory considerations. So risk in terms of compliance. So this photo uh, is a, a southern cassowary in far north Queensland. It's listed as endangered. It's afforded protection under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and also the Queensland Nature Conservation Act. Um, I'm illustrating this with this particular photo because they are protected, their habitat is protected, and it is a consideration for uh, proposed development that may impact these regulated species or regulated areas. So it's an example of how widespread regulations are and the requirement for compliance and risk for clients. It could be relevant to a range of um, developments, it could be wind farms, could be property development or any ongoing operational works. Audits can assist with compliance with regulations. I'll leave up this lovely photo um, just while I continue discussing some of the aspects of governance. And my experience with auditing of certified and non-certified management systems really have been equally relevant. Clients with non-certified management systems or parts thereof they're recognising the value of auditing their management systems uh, in light of growing responsibilities to manage governance obligations. Many are requiring voluntary audits to assist with their risk management, with the risk audits, audits uh, frequently tabled for their risk committees. So another great advantage of these audits also is to identify opportunities for improvement these can be a simple change to a workplace practice. It's sometimes only an outside eye might recognise and doesn't necessarily require the investment of a whole bunch of new capital. So I think the future for auditing is there's going to be more auditing. Uh, auditing, of course, like anything, is required to progress to keep up with changes both in standards themselves for undertaking auditing, but also other aspects such as changes to industries, corporate reporting, uh, global conditions and technology. And there are some aspects which are totally outside of our control. They're unplanned for. Uh, take, for instance, COVID-19. Like so many things, this has a direct impact on how auditing of certain management systems can be undertaken. For a start, in some cases, travel to site is not possible, yet pre-COVID days, a site inspection was a given and assumed part of the process. Clients may also have very different financial positions as a result of uh, COVID and require cost savings where there are possible. However, many still are required to comply with regulatory, regulatory requirements, as well as meeting their own risk appetite some of which means fulfilling their own voluntary audit requirements and greater reporting obligations. So while auditing has been evolving regardless with greater plans, such as digital technology, the development of data capture software and advanced audit, audit, audit analytics, a much sharper, quicker transition to developing acceptable methods for undertaking remote audits has been required. This has been largely triggered due to the restrictions on travel. Whatever the options with regard to carrying out the audit, these obviously have to achieve regulatory compliant, compliance, meet the client's risk appetite, achieve the scope of the audit, be readily achievable, and also meet the requirements, the standards for auditing. 
I think the concept of remote audits ties in quite nicely with the theme of the uh, current conference. So while restrictions have been frustrating to an extent, it's really provided an opportunity to explore alternatives to completing audits, such as completing them remotely. So there have been some real wins, I think, to an outcome for you know, this change of thought process around auditing remotely uh, for clients, for, I mean, my business and potential clients, just by the nature of more commonly practiced virtual and online interaction and digital transformation. I think there's a greater appreciation that remote work is a more accepted business and a risk management proposition. So remote audits are relevant, I mean, COVID or not, uh, I'm just uh, using COVID really as a purpose of illustrating the process um, because it is very pertinent to today's societies. Uh, we here in Australia are currently experiencing a, a really large spike in COVID cases, resulting in several state lockdowns and travel restrictions across the country and inter internationally the borders remain mostly closed. So I'm unable to travel to work and particularly the sites where I have audits lined up to do in these areas. So in my previous presentation, for example, Global, I did discuss taking a risk-based approach to understanding an audit remotely and various tools to consider for remote auditing. So in the first instance, a risk assessment can be useful to determine the profile of risk related to undertaking an audit remotely versus not taking the, uh, undertaking the audit at all. So questions to ask could be, what is the risk of completing an audit remotely? Is it possible? Does it meet the regulatory requirements? Does it meet the auditing standards? Will it be possible to not go to site if certain activities aren't audited, how will these be managed and related actions captured going forward? Will the right people still be available to be interviewed for the audit if it's undertaken remotely? That is, is the site, if the site's remote, is there internet and mobile access available or are personnel on two ways communi communicating uh, internally but unable to externally? As an example of an alternative uh, to direct observations by the auditor, if the auditor is to rely on photos of the activities rather than observing them personally, are they satisfied with making a call on these photographs of activities rather than seeing the actual activities themselves or will auditing over Teams or Zoom cut it? For example, in this slide, there is an excavator working on the edge of the World Heritage Area, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in North Queensland in Australia. Would these photo, or photos similar to this provide the auditor with a level of confidence that full compliance with the permits and approved management documents is being achieved? For example, is the photo clear enough to see whether unauthorised impacts to water quality or damage to coral is occurring? Could an acceptable alternative be footage from a drone that may contextualise the image with film more adequately showing the movement of machinery and the impacts to the receiving environment? By way of another example, in this slide, there are personnel in an excavation for a wind turbine foundation. Considerations could be whether there's sufficient detail in this photo provide an auditor with surety regarding the workplace practices that are being implemented. What alternatives might there be if the auditor isn't satisfied with these photos? In the instance for an asset inspection as required as part of the quality management system, with this particular photo, would the auditor be satisfied to sign off on a structure that poses potential environmental and social risks without the option of undertaking an inspection? If this is the case, what are the options? Could it be that a local and suitably qualified engineer, not subject to travel restrictions, complete an inspection to engineering standards instead and provide written outcomes to the order, auditor? Could that manage the risk? I'll leave risk here. While I won't go into as much detail about it going forward, keep it in the back of your mind regarding some of the future of auditing options particularly where relevant to remote audits going forward. So technology. 
have to say, love it, love it, love it, love. This section is all about the pros of technology. Um, some of the technology includes data capture software and advanced audit analytics, drones, thermal imagery, online teleconferencing platforms and cloud share folders. So there are lots of technology examples. I appreciate some people love technology, others prefer, prefer more conventional method, and there are pros and cons for both or mix thereof. The latter I'm the biggest fan of. Digital transformation is certainly providing some unique opportunities for auditing, uh, but maybe in some situations, you know, they'll save trawling through handwritten records, which previously may, in some situations, I guess they, you can avoid trawling through a whole bunch of handwritten records, which previously may have been the case. So I'm just going to hopefully go back to um, starting up the uh, just showing you some software and applications that have been useful. These are just examples of ends and maps I use, but some of them I haven't used, but other uh, colleagues have. Um, I think they're basically a data collection application. So if you're in the field, for example, you can collect data and can bring all that information together. So when the auditor has a look at it, all that information is there for them. So auditing relies heavily on the review of administration and record keeping. There's often a restricted time for undertaking the audit, so the efficiency is key. Uh, sometimes they, there may be a risk of missing something due to a lack of time or, or due to a lack of records. Fortunately, there are a number of applications that have developed that makes collation and presentation of easier, uh, much easier presentation much easier for the auditor. So a few applications that help are shown here with data organisational tools, and there are many, many more. Uh, many of these aim to improve performance and outcomes for clients, both cost and time efficiencies, and to keep project costs generally down. Data capture software and advanced audit analytics are really useful tools for audits, and I think can help audits to be more thorough. But to have all the information readily available online, it is such a great thing uh, for auditing. As mentioned, there's generally a time restriction when it comes to reviewing records particularly. For example, review of quality control records for every engineering in a local government area. Um, it can be really difficult to track if hard copy or no copy because the age of assets is available. So the use of these can come in handy. Uh, the success of this is dependent on the client and, of course, their own investment in this type of data management. Uh, by providing audit criteria ahead of time, the client can organise the data management software to assist the audit running more efficiently. The beauty is, too, that providing the client on site has internet available. This part of the auditing process can be undertaken on an online forum, such as a teleconference. Um, Teams or Zoom type platform where screens can be shared and database, database is visible. This is valuable to interviews too, providing the correct personnel are available. So something to keep in mind with the use of this type of data management system is that training may be required for personnel to effectively use it. Also consider what happens when there's no internet connection, internet connection on a site. If there is no internet, then this technology may be redundant. So the collection of imagery at an audit can be tricky as an auditor if you're relying on photos that someone else is taking. Photos can be subjective depending on angles and they may not provide the whole picture. It may be the photographer is thinking they're acquiring the imagery you're after when in fact it's not the IBC of hydrochloric acid I want to see, it's the condition of the bund. Or wow, that photo is a long way away from the asset that needs a review and the details are unclear. However, photos can still be a useful tool for an audit. 
Having said that, I think the drones are a winner in setting context and exploring areas that either A, you just can't get into, or B, it would take a heck of a long time to assess that area. The use of drones, such as the couple that are shown, well, actually there's three different drones uh, in, that, in the slide there. Um, they, they would be, drones are just all relevant to the whole three streams of my certified auditing experience. They're just really terrific because they can collect contextual information and there can be time and cost efficiencies for clients. So uh, this slide is um, for an audit of local government assets and it's in the top of the photo you can see a reservoir. While in this uh, instant, the reservoir would have been really easy to access by foot and by vehicle. It was the aerial context that we were chasing. Um, we did this for a number of them to enable managers to make decisions regarding vehicle and emergency access provisions. Um, there was some cyclone damage in this instance, uh, so there were quite a few areas where, um, yeah, I guess vehicle access was prevented by fallen, fallen trees. So I have got a video here. Um, it's a bit slow playing, and if you do experience a little vertigo, it might be wise to look away periodically. Uh, but we took this footage. Essentially, they're a lime cast system in uh, central Queensland in Australia. Um, we went out there, we were trying to cut down some field time by collecting the aerial imagery over this area. Also, it's quite dangerous, so it's very sharp and rocky not the ideal thing to be climbing all over. Uh, sending the drone up to was a heck of a lot cheaper than trying to catch footage, uh, footage from a chopper. So as you can see, the drone is moving over and catching, uh, capturing the context of that particular area. So this is a field audit related to um, environmental and cultural matters. Um, it was about the risk of proposed activities that included a lot of noise, direct impacts and vibrations. So to, to have collected this data on foot, we estimated would have added another four, uh, week or five people in the field and associated costs. So it enabled us to order the site and the key priorities for the client in a time and cost efficient way. Uh, another example, I don't have a photo of it, um, but we did do another uh, assessment of um, a wind turbine. Uh, it was for uh, the client, basically they were doing a quality management system of their assets. We sent um, the drone up the turbine. Uh, it was also deemed more safe from a workplace health and safety point of view. Um, maybe not for the drone because it was a little windy and we ended up uh, dropping, <laughs> dropping the drone and breaking the gimbal. But regardless, we managed to collect some really good data that the engineers were able to use uh, to feed into the client's quality management system. And I think too, really, and I think this slide is uh, very clear, you make a lot of good new friends with a drone. Um, when we were doing a work in PNG and we may have in some situations have been on our own, um, yeah, people would appear from everywhere once they could see and hear that drone, uh, drone traveling up through the air. Uh, one of the key things with the drones really is just that it, it's about getting in there in areas that you might not be able to collect data for that are relevant for your audits. I think while we embrace technology because it is so terrific to streamline and be cost effective um, as well as help or assist with identifying some additional risks, you know, for the benefit of the client in these audits. Um, technology, you know, is definitely so worthwhile considering for your audit program. Having said that, one of the biggest risks with technology is being somewhere for an audit and you have find out you have no internet and you have no power to recharge your equipment. Um, so don't put away that paper checklist and pen just yet. I think it really is a unique balance of using both technology and the old fashioned way. An example of this recently uh, was we had a colleague doing some field work 
uh, in PNG in a remote area and he had been given an iPad with um, some of the data software that I popped up on the screen a bit earlier. Um, it wasn't a Venza, but it was one of the others. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't use it because he did need internet connection where he was. So fortunately, as a backup plan, we had provided him a bunch of paper template checklists that he could fill in while he was in the field, um, which, you know, essentially he sent back to us. And sure, it took a little bit more time for us to enter it into, the, into a database, but, you know, it, it meant he could collect the data, which was really valuable for the sake of the audit. So in conclusion for the presentation today, um, there are an, a growing number of purposes for audits. Um, at the beginning, I did highlight a lot more sort of auditing requirements around meeting environmental social governance risks, um, risks and reporting requirements, um, speedy transition requirements to re, uh, remote auditing, uh, such as at the moment as a result of COVID. Um, I'd suggest a risk assessment is a really handy tool to work out whether this is suitable or not, or whether there's any alternative options available um, in that situation. Uh, technology, uh, there's, as mentioned, there's some really great technology out there to assist with audits, um, to keep all the information together and uh, to help with identifying risk for the client. And I guess just a final thought is, like I mentioned, don't put away that paper checklist and pen just yet. I think it's very important that we consider both hand in hand. Uh, you'll never know when you might be caught short with internet or power, even if you're just working locally, but your battery goes in your iPhone that you take photos with or, um, or your phone that you collect data with. So um, I think, yeah, keep them both in mind when you're doing your programming. So many thanks for uh, yeah, listening in today to this presentation and I hope there were some valuable points in it. Uh, if you'd like to connect, um, I've included my LinkedIn details there and direct email address. So uh, thanks very much. Well, and thank you, Kristen Keene, for that look at changing times within the auditing profession. And that concludes this presentation.